On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres by Nicholas Copernicus Chapter 5 Does circular motion suit the Earth? What is its position? Now that the Earth too has been shown to have the form of a sphere, we must in my opinion see whether also in this case the form entails the motion and what place in the universe is occupied by the earth? Without the answers to these questions, it is impossible to find the correct explanation of what is seen in the heavens. To be sure, there is general agreement among the authorities that the earth is at rest in the middle of the universe. They hold the contrary view to be inconceivable or downright silly. Nevertheless, if we examine the matter more carefully, we shall see that this problem has not yet been solved, and is therefore by no means to be disregarded. Every observed change of place is caused by a motion of either the observed object, or the observer, or, of course, by an unequal displacement of each. For when things move with equal speed in the same direction, the motion is not perceived, as between the observed object and the observer, I mean. It is the earth, however, from which the celestial ballet is beheld in its repeated performance before our eyes. Therefore, if any motion is ascribed to the earth, in all things outside it, the same motion will appear, but in the opposite direction, as though they were moving past it. Such in particular is the daily rotation, since it seems to involve the entire universe except the earth, and what is around it. However, if you grant that the heavens have no part in this motion, but that the earth rotates from west to east, Upon earnest consideration, you will find that this is the actual situation concerning the apparent rising and setting of the sun, moon, stars, and planets. Moreover, since the heavens, which enclose and provide the setting for everything, constitute the space common to all things, it is not at first blush clear why motion should not be attributed rather to the enclosed than to the enclosing, to the thing located in space rather than to the framework of space. This opinion was indeed maintained by Heraclides and Ecphantus, the Pythagoreans, and by Ephesetus of Syracuse according to Cicero. They rotated the earth in the middle of the universe, for they ascribed the setting of the stars to the earth's interposition, and their rising to its withdrawal. If we assume its daily rotation, another and no less important question follows concerning the earth's position. To be sure, heretofore there has been virtually unanimous acceptance of the belief that the middle of the universe is the earth. Anyone who denies that the Earth occupies the middle or center of the universe may nevertheless assert that its distance therefrom is insignificant in comparison with the sphere of the fixed stars, but perceptible and noteworthy in relation to the spheres of the Sun and the other planets. He may deem this to be the reason why their motions appear non-uniform, as conforming to a center other than the center of the earth. Perhaps he can produce a not inept explanation of the apparent non-uniform motion, for the fact that the same planets are observed nearer to the earth and farther away necessarily proves that the center of the earth is not the center of their circles. It is less clear whether the approach and withdrawal are executed by the Earth or the planets. It will occasion no surprise if, in addition to the daily rotation, some other motion is assigned to the Earth. That the Earth rotates, that it also travels with several motions, that it is one of the heavenly bodies, are said to have been the opinions of Philolaus the Pythagorean. 
He was no ordinary astronomer inasmuch as Plato did not delay going to Italy for the sake of visiting him, as Plato's biographers report. But many have thought it possible to prove by geometrical reasoning that the Earth is in the middle of the universe, that being like a point in relation to the immense heavens, it serves as their center, and that it is motionless because when the universe moves, the center remains unmoved, and the things newest to the center are carried most slowly. Chapter 6 The Immensity of the Heavens Compared to the Size of the Earth The massive bulk of the Earth does indeed shrink to insignificance in comparison with the size of the heavens. This can be ascertained from the fact that the boundary circles, for that is the translation of the Greek term horizons, bisect the entire sphere of the heavens. This could not happen if the Earth's size or distance from the universe's center were noteworthy in comparison with the heavens. For a circle that bisects a sphere passes through its center, and is the greatest circle that can be described on it. Thus let circle A, B, C, D be a horizon, and let the Earth from which we do our observing be E, the center of the horizon which separates what is seen from what is not seen. Now through a dioptra or horoscopic instrument, or water level place at E, let the first point of the crab be sighted rising at point C, and at that instant the first point of the goat is perceived to be setting at A. Then A, E and C are on a straight line through the dioptra, this line is evidently a diameter of the ecliptic, since six visible sides form a semicircle, and E, the center, is identical with the horizon's center. Again, let the signs shift their position until the first point of the goat rises at B. At that time, the crab will also be observed setting at D. B, E, D will be a straight line, and a diameter of the ecliptic. But as we have already seen, ABC also is a diameter of the same circle. Its center, obviously, is the intersection. A horizon, then, in this way, always bisects the ecliptic, which is the great circle of the sphere. But on a sphere, if a circle bisects any great circle, the bisecting circle is itself a great circle. Consequently, a horizon is one of the great circles, and its center is clearly identical with the center of the ecliptic. Yet a line drawn from the Earth's surface to a point in the firmament must be distinct from the line drawn from the Earth's center. Nevertheless, because these lines are immense in relation to the Earth, they become like parallel lines. Because their terminus is enormously remote, they appear to be a single line. For in comparison with their length, the space enclosed by them becomes imperceptible, as is demonstrated in optics. This reasoning certainly makes it quite clear that the heavens are immense by comparison with the earth, and present the aspect of an infinite magnitude. While on the testimony of the senses, the earth is related to the heavens as a point to a body, and a finite to an infinite magnitude. But no other conclusion seems to have been established for it does not follow that the Earth must be at rest in the middle of the universe. Indeed, a rotation in 24 hours of the enormously vast universe should astonish us even more than a rotation of its least part, which is the Earth. For the argument that the center is motionless, and what is nearest the center moves the least, does not prove that the Earth is at rest in the middle of the universe. To take a similar case, suppose you say that the heavens rotate but the poles are stationary, and what is closest to the poles moves the least. 
The little bear, for example, being very close to the pole is observed to move much more slowly than the eagle or the little dog because it describes a smaller circle. Yet all these constellations belong to a single sphere. A sphere's movement vanishing at its axis does not permit an equal motion of all its parts. Nevertheless, these are brought round in equal times, though not over equal spaces by the rotation of the whole sphere. The upshot of the argument, then, is the claim that the Earth, as a part of the celestial sphere, shares in the same nature and movement so that, being close to the center, it has a slight motion. Therefore, being a body and not the center, it too will describe arcs like those of a celestial circle, though smaller in the same time. The falsity of this contention is clearer than daylight, for it would always have to be noon in one place, and always midnight in another, so that the daily risings and settings could not take place since the motion of the whole and the part would be one and inseparable. But things separated by the diversity of their situations are subject to a very different relation. Those enclosed in a smaller orbit revolve faster than those traversing a bigger circle. Thus Saturn, the highest of the planets, revolves in 30 years, the moon, undoubtedly the nearest to the Earth, completes its course in a month. And to close the series, it will be thought, the Earth rotates in the period of a day and a night. Accordingly, the same question about the daily rotation emerges again. On the other hand, likewise still undetermined is the Earth's position, which has been made even less certain by what was said above. For that proof establishes no conclusion other than the heavens unlimited size in relation to the earth. Yet how far this immensity extends is not at all clear. At the opposite extreme are the very tiny indivisible bodies called atoms. Being imperceptible, they do not immediately constitute a visible body when they are taken two or a few at a time but they can be multiplied to such an extent that in the end there are enough of them to combine in a perceptible magnitude. The same may be said also about the position of the Earth. Although it is not in the center of the universe, nevertheless its distance therefrom is still insignificant, especially in relation to the sphere of the fixed stars. Chapter 7 Why the ancients thought that the Earth remained at rest in the middle of the universe as its center. Accordingly, the ancient philosophers sought to establish that the Earth remains at rest in the middle of the universe by certain other arguments. As their main reason, however, they adduce heaviness and lightness. Earth is in fact the heaviest element, and everything that has weight is borne toward it in an effort to reach its inmost center. The Earth being spherical, by their own nature, heavy objects are carried to it from all directions at right angles to its surface. Hence, if they were not checked at its surface, they would collide at its center, since a straight line perpendicular to a horizontal plane at its point of tangency with a sphere leads to the center. But things brought to the middle, it seems to follow, come to rest at the middle. All the more then will the entire Earth be at rest in the middle. And as the recipient of every falling body will remain motionless thanks to its weight. In like manner, the ancient philosophers analyzed motion and its nature in a further attempt to confirm their conclusion. Thus, according to Aristotle, the motion of a single simple body is simple. Of the simple motions, one is straight and the other is circular. Of the straight motions, one is upward and the other is downward. 
Hence every simple motion is either toward the middle, that is, downward, or away from the middle, that is, upward, or around the middle, that is, circular. To be carried downward, that is, to seek the middle, is a property only of earth and water, which are considered heavy. On the other hand, air and fire, which are endowed with lightness, move upward and away from the middle. To these four elements it seems reasonable to assign rectilinear motion, but to the heavenly bodies circular motion around the middle. This is what Aristotle says, heavens 1, 2, 11, 14. Therefore, remarks Ptolemy of Alexandria, if the earth were to move merely in a daily rotation, the opposite of what was said above would have to occur, since the motion would have to be exceedingly violent and its speed unsurpassable to carry the entire circumference of the earth around in 24 hours. But things which undergo an abrupt rotation seem utterly unsuited to gather and seem more likely, if they have been produced by combination, to fly apart unless they are held together by some bond. The earth would long ago have burst asunder, he says, and dropped out of the skies, a quite preposterous notion. And what is more, living creatures and any other loose weights would by no means remain unshaken. Nor would objects falling in a straight line descend perpendicularly to their appointed place, which would meantime have been withdrawn by so rapid a movement. Moreover, clouds and anything else floating in the air would be seen drifting always westward.